So my lab studies the nucleus, um, and the nucleus is uh, the structure that's found in most of our cells that contains our DNA, our genetic information. I think for a long time, the, the thinking was that um, that was sort of the only function of the nucleus. It was just this compartment that held the DNA. But what's become clear is that actually the structure of the nucleus is really important for its function. There are a number of diseases that are associated with changes in the, the shape of the nucleus. So I think it's becoming sort of a, a hotter topic, but it still is relatively, um, uh, there aren't that many of us working on these problems, I'd say. What my lab is really interested in understanding is something about what controls the size of the nucleus. Big cells tend to have larger nuclei, small cells tend to have smaller nuclei, and it turns out there's a really interesting disease connection when it comes to nuclear size in that in cancer cells, nuclei become um, inappropriately enlarged. This change in nuclear size is used diagnostically, but what isn't known is if this change in nuclear size might be important for the development of the cancer or for the progression of the cancer. So if we can go into those cancer cells and force the nuclei to become smaller, um, that might be a way, a new way of treating those cancers. I guess if I look back at sort of all of my previous research, there's almost always been some aspect of trying to understand um, sort of size regulation at the subcellular level. And I just think it's a fascinating problem because you know, at, in our sort of macroscopic world, we have such an intuition about size and we know how long something is or the volume of something or even getting into time, you know, an intuition for lengths of time. And we have devices for measuring these things. But then when you get down to the level of the cell, the microscopic subcellular level, and these same parameters seem to be important, but at a subcellular level, how are these measurements being made? How does the cell deal with these issues that seem so intuitive, but at the molecular level, what's really going on? So what we'd really like to understand is something about um, how nuclear size is regulated, what are the mechanisms that regulate nuclear size, and so a lot of times the best systems are cases where the problem already exists in nature and nature has solved the problem. One instance of this is in the case of early embryogenesis. Early in development, you have big cells, big nuclei. Later in development, cells are smaller and nuclei are smaller, and now we can ask what has changed during embryogenesis to regulate this reduction in nuclear size. We use frog embryos um, where this, this exact type of nuclear size regulation occurs. So there's a number of different ways that we can manipulate nuclear size. I guess the very basic system that we use in the lab makes use of frog egg extracts. We collect eggs from the frogs. We can just inject them with a hormone. And then when we um, centrifuge those eggs, they break open and they partition into different um, components. And one of those layers is the cytoplasm, which is pretty amazing that, that sort of all the self-organization information that's needed to make a nucleus is present in that, in that cytoplasm. We can make frog or human proteins and bacteria, purify those proteins, add that to our egg extract, and then ask, what happens to the size of the nuclei that we assemble in that extract. The other system that we use in the lab for studying size regulation is another frog system. So instead of looking at early embryogenesis, what we do is we compare two different frog species. One of the, the pathways that we found that's important for regulating size is nuclear import. Nuclei have structures called nuclear pore complexes within the nuclear envelope, and these are basically passageways or channels that allow proteins to be transported into and out of the nucleus. And what we found is that in the Xenopus labus frogs the, that have larger nuclei, um, the, the rates of nuclear import are faster, um, and that correlates with their larger size. We've determined some of the, the proteins that are different in these two frogs that are responsible for these difference, differences in import rates, um, and also identified some of the specific proteins that are being imported that are important for determining this difference in size. Believe it or not, frog cells are very much like human cells, and so much of what we learn about uh, cell biology in the frog we expect to also be true in human cells, and this has certainly proved to be true in the past. We can change size in these human cells, and we're using both sort of normal human cells as well as cells that have been derived from cancers. When you have an initial, a primary tumor, that in principle wouldn't be too difficult to treat because you can surgically or, or using chemotherapy go in and take it out. But when those cells acquire the ability to move 
and to spread into the bloodstream and then to take up residence in other areas of the body and form what are called metastases, that's when you, know, you have a true cancer and that's, that, that is what becomes very difficult to treat. We have some sort of hints um, that, that cell proliferation is reduced so that cells are growing more slowly in these um, cells where we've reduced the size of the nuclei. But my hope would be that, you know, we do find that changing nuclear size affects cancer growth characteristics. And if that's true, that there might be interest in trying to develop drugs or approaches that would target nuclear size. Pretty much all of the research that that I've done has been very much this kind of basic cell biology research. Can't really understand what's going wrong in a cell until we understand how it, it normally functions. We take the cell, we take it apart, we figure out what are all the components, what are they doing, how do they work with each other. And then once we have that basic cell biology understanding, when something goes wrong, we can really um, take a more targeted approach to treating the dysfunction that's happened. You design an experiment and you get a result and it doesn't happen often but you get a really cool and new result and you kind of have that momentary sort of realization that you're probably the only person in the world that knows how this little thing works um, and it's just it's kind of exhilarating. Mm -hmm.